This is a reminder that this episode will address various topics related to addiction, compulsive gambling, mental health, triggers, and a reminder about multiple sclerosis. These may be sensitive to some of our viewers. Viewer discretion, as always, is advised. We remind you to please consult your doctor, your mental health professional, your, your outreach group, or your, sp your, <laughs> your sponsor or specialist before adopting any change to your dietary, physical, or, and or mental health regime. If you're looking for options with respect to mental health, contact SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, at 1-800-662-HELP. That's 1-800-662-4357. The service is open 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year, and it's a confidential free information service for individuals and family members facing such stressors. Importantly, if you're feeling suicidal crisis or emotional distress and need to be put in touch with a crisis center, call a Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-TALK. That's 1-800-273-8255. Or go to suicidepreventionlifeline.org. You can also text the word HOME to 741-741. Those resources are also available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year. And I wouldn't be doing one of these disclaimers without talking about something that has been prevalent in my mind for the last year, but moreover the last 11 years, in that of multiple sclerosis and demyelination. The National MS Society is a collective of passionate individuals who want to do something about MS now, to move together towards a world free of multiple sclerosis. Multiple sclerosis is comprised of unpredictable and often disabling flare-ups of the central nervous system. Such flare-ups disrupt the flow of information within the brain and between the brain, the, between the brain and the body. The National MS Society is the largest private funder of MS researchers in the world, investing more than $1 billion to date. MS stops people from moving, but the National MS Society exists to make sure that MS doesn't. To contact the National MS Society, please call 1-800-344-4867. Once again, 1-800-344-4867 or go to their website at nationalmssociety.org. Thank you to all of you who have donated, to all, well, thank you to all of you who have donated money to this amazing organization or even gone to the National MS Society to learn more about multiple sclerosis and demyelination. It touches me and over to 1 million people in this country who have multiple sclerosis in so many ways. And we appreciate all of you. And on that, let's begin. Every now and then we have to cover some miscellaneous topics and also cover things that we talked about before. And given that this month was very strange, it is worth revisiting the topics that we talked about in January, but also preview the topics that we're gonna cover in February, because this is the Venture Forward.
Good evening, or good morning, or good afternoon, wherever you may be, and welcome to the Venture Forward. I am John Venturini, a recovering addict of overeating obesity, alcoholism, and compulsive gambling, and it is an honor and pleasure to see all of you tonight on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch. Um... I wanted to do a miscellaneous show at the end of January. There were things that transpired in the month of January that we'll talk about, but I wanted to cover some of the highlights of the topics we covered this month as well. And I think it was worth repeating, but also talk to exactly some of the things I want to talk about next month in February as well. So we're doing this sort of episode near the end of the month to do that very thing. But before we begin, let's see who wins the door prize tonight. And that would be Jamie. Jamie says, hi, hey friends. Jamie, how are you? Hope you're doing well. We have Michelle on Facebook saying hashtag share squad. And she also says on YouTube, hello, my VF fam. Love you, Michelle. Hope you're doing well. Canadian flag shining brighter than ever before. And we got a certain co-host of VF Talks from Friday nights, uh, Matt Haas, who says hello. And Matt, it is good to see you this evening as well. So there are many things we are going to talk about tonight. This could be just a scattering of things and always your questions and comments. But I wanted to try something out for the first time. Side panel. There it is. So we're going to talk about gambling. We're going to be talking about triggers. We're going to be talking about food again. Basically a better relationship with food. We're going to recover those three topics from earlier in the month. I'm going to take a few minutes out and talk about what happened to me in the beginning of the month that nearly, nearly, nearly took me out. And we'll talk about COVID as it pertains to me. I'm going to take a few minutes out and talk about the journalism creed. It's something we mentioned on the show before, but I think it was, you know, it's definitely bear, bears repeating. And we're going to do that tonight as well. And I'm going to quote the latest selection from the language of letting go. That will become a muchly permanent portion of this show because I'm finding through my travels and whatnot that codependency is definitely part of this story. In fact, so much so that there will be an episode revisiting codependency next month. And we'll talk about February and the various topics to basically put a giant bow on this episode tonight. But let's start by talking about the thing that was very much a thing that got me tongue-tied back earlier in the month when we covered it. And it's getting me tongue-tied now, but we're going to press through and cover it in that of compulsive gambling. So... Compulsive gambling is basically a definition that we've you know basically covered before. It's the uncontrollable urge to keep gambling despite the toll it takes on your life. The fact that you're willing to risk something you value in the hope of getting something of even greater value to reckless sort of uh, abandon, if I would say. Uh, stimulates the brain's reward system, much like drugs or alcohol can leading to, uh, can leading to addiction. Uh, Continually chasing bets, leading to losses, hiding your behavior, depleting uh, savings, accumulating debt, even resorting to theft or fraud to support your addiction. It is very much a serious condition that can destroy lives. And although treating compulsive gambling can be challenging, many people who struggle with compulsive gambling have found help through professional treatment and therapy and groups such as Gamblers Anonymous. Very much part of the ways that I've been dealing with it as far as ta uh, tackling, oh, wow, well, wrong graphic, as, as far as tackling it through therapy, but also through recovery groups. Very much important. Um, I, I think about these things and I think about what sort of taxing thing has occurred to me with gambling and the after effects of it from a financial perspective, but also from a social perspective as well. It is downright scary and as you could tell from the earlier portion of this month, it was very hard to get through. And, you know, it's just a reality that I am currently going through each and every month as I'm paying the bankruptcy, uh, the U.S. Bankruptcy Court, uh, given my Chapter 13 bankruptcy, as a reminder 
of how much money I spent gambling. We talk about loyalty at what cost. Talk about times in Atlantic City and Las Vegas and within Pennsylvania and Delaware, Maryland, Connecticut. It is a sort of situation where you're going to these sort of places for a habit that doesn't do you any good. And sure, would you go to a show or go to a th- uh, go to out for dinner or whatnot? Yeah, you do. But the thing is, you end up gambling, and that's why casinos bring you in to do that. What sort of effect we're talking about? We're talking about a very unhealthy addiction where I won money left and right and then I ended up giving that back and then some because, as I mentioned before, there is no satiation. None. So it doesn't matter how much I win, the casinos or the PA lottery even is going to get it back. There are a couple of questions that transpired since that episode that I wanted to address real quickly. One, even though I had a considerable amount of, I would call it in air quotes, good luck, that money ended up coming back because there was no off switch. And you talk about gambling and the sort of, a, the sort of um, ills that a gambler has. It's exactly that. There is no off switch. They keep on rolling money back in, whether they're chasing their bets or they're trying to create a fortune that does not exist and that's why the casino will always have an edge that was one thing the second thing is i am triggered based on what i went through based on the things i did but i think i have a healthier relationship as far as talking about it and not partaking in it there are many different things that are going on here in the sense that there is a bankruptcy against me and the fact that there was an audit in the middle of the most tumultuous time of my life. These are life lessons that came to me in the most critical of times, which where I think about, oh, gambling sounds great. No, it doesn't. It ruined a good portion of my life and I could tie it back to that bottom and it's all I need to know without question. You know, we talk about the, the sites of the big wins and whatnot. What does it mean? I'm going to bring back this graphic from earlier in, the, uh, earlier in the month in the sense that I have too much debt. Now, those numbers have come down a little bit, but the debt is still there and it's being worked through a bankruptcy and whatnot, but I cannot be remiss of these numbers. Two hundred plus thousand dollars of total unsecured debt, a mortgage of two hundred eighty-three thousand, total debt of nearly five hundred grand, and even though there's assets of three sixty, value of the home, etc., that still puts me in a net debt of nearly one hundred forty thousand dollars. Which, if I had a healthier relationship with money, that wouldn't be the case. But yet, that's what's going on, and is really tough to talk about that but it's also very empowering to know that i'm trying to do the right things to get past it claiming bankruptcy was a very important thing for sure why does this happen why does someone like me end up in that sort of realm and it's simple two words an addictive personality looking for a personal loan would be great if i didn't have a problem with addiction So instead, we talk about unsecured debt. I had five personal loans and a bevy of credit cards. I think it was 14 credit cards. So 19 vehicles of unsecured debt. When my net income is two-thirds of how much I must pay in each month, debt consolidation, credit counseling were way overdue, and that's when bankruptcy became a solution. A painful one one that will be on my record for the next seven years and five years to get through the payments, but it's there. And I'm reminded of that each and every month. I'll give you a case in point. I'm trying to put, I'm trying to refinance this house, which is much more difficult when you're going through a chapter 13 bankruptcy because you have to work with your bankruptcy attorney and the U.S. bankruptcy court to get that done. And the rate that you're getting is not necessarily the greatest rate that's out there. 
it's not as bad as the rate that I have now, but I have to go through these additional steps because I'm bankrupt. I've claimed bankruptcy. So I can't go through things from a normal sort of perspective. Another thing, if I wanted to go buy a car or lease a car, I have to work through the bankruptcy court to do that. The U.S. Bankruptcy Trustee, which great office, mind you, but it is another step, another thing that has to go through because they want to do their due diligence and make sure that I am worthy. And I wouldn't say worthy, but I guess capable of handling a car loan or a car lease or a new mortgage. You get the idea. It is very, very difficult, but very, very necessary given how much debt I have. A couple of questions came up. Laura says, it is brave to share your journey. Thank you, Laura. I appreciate that. It is, um, it is my life. And I'd be remiss not to share this portion because it is one of the three numbers in there up on that board with respect to my gambling. And one of the results of the gambling is bankruptcy, is massive amounts of debt and all of that. So thank you for, uh, for telling me that. I appreciate that big time. Sarah asks a really good question. Sarah, by the way, how are you doing? Uh, Sarah asks, do you feel you have a healthy relationship with money now? I have a healthier relationship with money right now. Is it perfect? No. There's still old tendencies that still are there. Do I, do I want to go out to eat every now and then? I do. And within reason, I do, right? It's not incredibly cost prohibitive, but it's something I have to keep an eye on, how much I bring in, plus the the bills and expenses that I have. It is a newfound behavior because outside of the gambling, there was also a laissez-faire attitude towards money. There was a lot of dinners out. There was a lot of trips and vacations. You know, it, this is, without credit cards, it's very hard to do that sort of thing, right? And now where I have no credit cards, you can understand the sort of dilemma I go through. Matt says, and he laughs, all his money goes to audio and video gear. I would think that's a much better investment than what I was basically unloading all that money to. So your audio and video gear is definitely much more a better investment than a video poker machine, a craps table, the lottery, so on and so forth. But again, that's part of the reality. There was nothing for me to invest that money into because I was so sick about trying to make more money in games that I had basically a minimal sort of edge on. So that was the conversation about gambling. And if you wanted to know more about that, well, you could watch the episode from earlier in the month, but I'm also available at theventureforward at gmail.com to talk about that for sure. So let's also talk, let's, uh, let's see what else we're tackling. We're going to talk about triggers. And it was a very important episode earlier in the month. And we're going to cover that uh, in a second. There was another comment that popped up in the sense that Matt says he spends a lot of money on whack-a-mole. He, he does, but see, the thing is, Matt is an incredible champion of whack-a-mole. So is it money well spent? I don't know, but he's, he's great at it. I've seen it before my very eyes, for sure. Sarah says she finds dealing in cash makes spending much more real to her. Credit cards make spending invisible. Yeah, because it's basically something where we're basically doing things on margin. We're not doing with things we actually have. We don't have those sort of assets. We have to borrow money to pay for dinner or go to the grocery store or put gas in the car, etc. So that was a very good point. It is somewhat invisible. But at the end of the month, guess what? Credit card companies don't want it to be invisible. They want you to start paying them back. And they'll charge incredible APRs if you don't have good credit. So that's how that game works. So we talk about an addictive personality. What other things do we talk about when we talk about personalities and, and the sort of things that we must be very well aware of? with with respect to the mental health journey and that is triggers how do we minimize or embrace our triggers we we can minimize our triggers by avoiding certain situations or behaviors such as not going to the bar casino 
or houses or, or houses of friends who you used to go use, drink, or gamble with. So if we remove ourselves from the situation, we can minimize the trigger effect for sure. Our brain has been conditioned to drink, overeat, gamble, and abuse in certain situations. So if you keep putting yourself in reckless situations, eventually willpower will fail you. One of the best strategies that anyone can do is learn healthy coping skills through therapy and 12-step programs, how to manage those triggers rather than just avoiding them. Avoiding is just basically a trigger in itself in the sense that we eventually fall to it. So we need to know how to manage it and embrace the situation and figure out what is the right call with respect to how we relate to it. As the next thing says, when you avoid triggers, you're training your brain to react even more to those triggers because it it believes these triggers are dangerous. And in some cases, they are. In me, in my case with the gambling, six digits worth of debt. So these are not really good situations. So we need to come up with a strategy around it. The way we do that is through health and coping skills, meetings, calling a sponsor, doing yoga, meditating, healthy activities. Through all of that, you end up becoming a lot more resilient. And within all of that, you come up with a strategy to deal with those things, but also deal with other things. For me, I consider myself someone who has a major cross addiction, an addiction of many different things that have the same sort of triggers. So I have to understand these coping mechanisms to rise above that. Some quick comments. Laura says she started therapy. Laura, that is the greatest news ever. Therapy for me has been a godsend. So I'm glad you are doing therapy for sure. And uh, a lot of people are congratulating you. Jamie says, awesome, Laura. Sarah says, yay, Laura. And Jamie is giving you a heart for that. And I give you a heart as well. That is huge. <clears throat> this is how we basically embrace triggers and try to minimize triggers. But what, what if those triggers are emotional? We talked about that on the show as well. So let's talk about that right now. It could be the most inane sort of thing, like mispronouncing a name or someone not getting back to you as soon as you would like them to. Our emotional triggers are basically a barometer reading, a temperature gauge for our life and how we're thinking about things. They tell us who's running the show, who's pulling our strings, and the temperature at which we've been living life. If we're running too fast, more times than not, we will lose that sort of self-control on the most simplest sort of things. Like having a problem when someone mispronounces our name. Between divorce, denials, disillusionment, debates, and disagreements, I have seen my share of triggers being pulled and have been guilty of pulling them myself, whether I realized it or not. The thing is, more times than not, we realize we're not doing it. We don't realize we're doing it, rather. And... It requires education. It requires becoming a lot more capable of understanding what triggers people, but also what triggers yourself and how those two things work in tandem. It becomes very important. So understanding that sort of dance is very important. It is very key as far as having any sort of beneficial relationship or any sort of beneficial, beneficial conversation even. So then we talked about how we make that stop. We have to know our trigger words. When they come up, it's okay for us to take a time out, to take a walk and calm ourselves down. We need to get plenty of sleep. Many of us, I included, don't get enough sleep sometimes. And we have to be aware of that. When we have people that are in our lives that are complaining all the time, that are draining our, our sort of fortitude and manipulating us, we need to get rid of them as soon as possible. If they don't need to, if they don't have a facility or utility to be in this life and they are negative and they keep on draining us, it's okay to fire them. It's okay to basically push them off. Whether it's a question of pushing them off wholesale or constructing major walls around them so they don't, they don't affect you as much. And that's another thing. 
constructing the right sort of wall, constructing the right sort of boundary is very much an important thing we need to do. Tied to that is canceling the negative self-talk card in the sense that we beat ourselves up more times than not. We should and absolutely should put ourselves higher. We deserve that because we are incredible and special and everybody is incredible and special and we should never browbeat ourselves. We are showing up. We are doing the best we can. We shouldn't beat ourselves up for that. And then the last comment, as I mentioned earlier in the month, if it becomes a problem, if you're drinking too much caffeine, lay off the caffeine a bit. In my case, I notice when I don't have as much caffeine, I'm still be I'm still able to be sharp, but I'm not as frantic as I would if I was having three Americanos in a given day. I mean, there is a certain sort of understanding of what caffeine does to us. In my case, with the multiple sclerosis, it's important because I need to have some sort of trigger of my neuroscience going on upstairs of my mental capacity but i cannot abuse that and more times than not people abuse caffeine so it's something that we have to be aware of i'm not saying full of abstaining from it but be aware of it and that's something that i'm trying to do more and more so from that i'm talking about mindful activity and mindless activity we talk about our relationship with food we talk about the relationship relationship with food being more than just a caloric sort of exercise, a macronutrient sort of exercise. We spent a good amount of time in the last episode talking about mindless eating versus mindful eating. So let's readdress that. Mindless eating would be something like eating past full and ignoring your body signals, whereas mindful eating would be listening to your body and stopping when it's full, when you're full. When you're mindlessly, mindlessly eating, you're eating when emotions tell you to eat. So if you're sad, bored, lonely, if you're emotionally eating, you're mindlessly eating. But when you're mindfully eating, you're eating when our bodies tell us to eat, like your stomach's growling or your energy's low. When you mindlessly eat, you eat alone at random times and places. When you mindfully eat, you eat with others at set times and places. So you're not eating in your office. You're eating at a table. You're eating somewhere where you're not doing work, but you're not also eating in front of the TV set in the living room. That's important. You have a dining room table or a kitchen nook. You should eat there. Shouldn't eat in front of the TV. Shouldn't eat at your desk. And you definitely should not be eating in bed. Mindlessly eating, well, then you'd be eating foods that are emotionally comforting because you're looking for that sort of chemical drip. Something that's high in sugar has been known to do that. It ties you back to a comforting situation. It ties you back to some sort of place of comfort. When we mindfully eat, then we're eating things that are nutritionally healthy. We have a better understanding of exactly what is in what we're eating. We might have a simpler ingredient list. We can talk about how much it's more in natural sort of minerals and vitamins and whatnot instead of things like raw or not raw, but, you know, granulated sugar or other things that can be a detriment to us. When we mindlessly eat, we can eat multitask, which is never good. We should be mindfully eating in the sense that when we eat, we're just eating. That's important. And that goes back to eating at a certain place and not doing anything else other than eating and being mindful of eating, which also means drinking water when you're eating or not consuming everything at once and taking in the food for what it is. Mindlessly eating would be considering a meal an end product, whereas when we mindfully eat, we take full consideration on where the food comes from. I told you a story in the last episode in the sense that some of the greatest restaurants com, you know, basically apply um, a policy of farm to table where they cite exactly what farms, what orchards, what gardens they basically get their food from. That's very important. It's a very much a mindful activity for us to realize that the food is coming locally. And in that degree, to that degree, it's a lot more healthier for us to consume that because we're not we're knowing it's not 
being transported cross country or around the world. We know it's being basically sourced from a farm down the street or a farm within the state or within the region instead of long distances. That's huge, very much huge. Within that conversation, we also talked about the things that were very important in my journey as far as losing the weight. So let's talk about that real quickly. Basal metabolism rate, BMR, total daily energy expenditure, TDEE. We've talked about those terms before on the show. Basically, the things that are calculated through the Harris-Benedict equation or the mifflin saint jour equation. These things are still very much important because many, many people, myself included, still believe that energy in versus energy out is a good way of gauging whether or not you're going to gain or lose weight. Within reason, there may be things that are going on through allergies or food sensitivities that may change that equation a bit. But on the most part, that energy in versus energy out is still a very bona fide rule as far as whether or not you're going to gain or lose weight within a week or a day or what have you. Also realize, and I'm going to go back to me for a second, also realize that your hydration and being bloated is definitely a play there too. If you're eating foods that are high in salt, if you're not drinking enough water, you're going to be heavier than you would expect to be just following uh, calorie, inver calorie in versus calorie out. So be aware of what you're consuming, not only from a, a quantitative perspective, but from a qualitative perspective as well. You know, the concept of calories in versus calories out goes back to something, and it's not completely on a science in the sense that's 500 calories or 500 calorie reduction per day is basically one pound per week uh, weight loss. It could be off by a little bit of a delta depending on, on your metabolism or whatnot, but on the most part, it's a good system. It's a system that's worked for me. And I've been dieting nearly three years and I've lost 300 plus pounds. So I can definitely be uh, a big advocate for that because I know it works for me. And then as far as tracking, well, there are many different tools out there that can help you out with that. Lose It is still the thing I will always tell you about is basically I'm a lifetime member of Lose It. And it's something where I, even to this day, I still track everything I consume, but I also track all my energy. I track all my activities. I track all my time at the gym, all of that. And it's also worth noting that the Venture Forward is not sponsored by Lose It, but Lose It is definitely a solid application. There are other applications out there like My Fitness Pal, Fat Secret Chronometer, and others. So definitely do your research. But any place where you could track what you're eating, any place where you could track your exercise, it's definitely a great place for you to go. And if you have a, an application that allows you to do that, you can more times than not be able to do it off of a website. You could do it off of an application and other sort of places to enter food in, enter activity in, or whatnot. The sophisticated applications, Lose It's definitely one of them, can make use of your watch, right? So if you have a Fitbit or an Apple Watch, it'll take the activity from your Fitbit or an Apple Watch and basically add that to the consideration within your log for a particular day. It's very powerful without question. Couple of final notes when it comes to that though. There is value to Weight Watchers or WW or Noom or whatnot. And one size definitely does not fit all. So do your research, figure out what works for you. And, and if you find that you're jumping from one method to another, there's nothing wrong with that. Lord only knows how many times I changed methods over the last 40 some odd years. So it wouldn't be outside the realm of, you know, plausibility there for sure. Exercise is just as pivotal as diet, but we have to think about it from this sort of perspective. Mind first, diet second, exercise third. The services mentioned provide dietary assistance as well as different applications and wellness providers. I definitely believe that if you're going to take the time to journal, I use something like day one, but you can use whatever journaling software you'd like to use. And I am definitely a big believer in Headspace. Headspace is very much something that I use for meditation outside of also looking at YouTube and looking at meditation videos as well. Meditation is one of the more, one of the more important things you can do for yourself each and every day.
It doesn't even have to be a full 20 minutes. It could be five minutes for all you care. To get that sort of centering, that sort of respite is very important. And we go back to our favorite disclaimer, always consult your doctor, nutritionist, or dietitian before embarking upon any sort of diet. It's important we say that on this show. We talk about a lot of different things and that of obesity, but also alcoholism, gambling, what have you. We talk that disclaimer a lot, and we're going to actually talk about the disclaimer we show at the end of each program, but also a, basically a caveat of the disclaimer I talk to at the beginning of every episode as well. It's important because as we go forward, it's... I felt the need to talk about that intent, but also my promise to you, the viewer, as far as the information I provide and also the sort of thing I'm asking you to do as you go down the road. So we'll, we'll get to that in a few minutes. Before we do that, I'm going to go back to side panel. I'm going to do um, something where, um, and, and I think I'm a little bit off on my, yeah, course I'm out. I uh, want to talk about what happened to me earlier in the month as far as COVID, but then I wanted to take time to talk about the journalism creed as well. So we're going to do that right now. Earlier this month, I went for uh, a booster for uh, COVID. And um, it was uh, January 4th this month. And I wasn't feeling well to begin with, but nevertheless, I got a full booster, full dose of the Moderna booster. And the rest of that week, I started feeling worse and worse and worse. I was running a 103, 104 fever. And by the end of the week, and if you remember the episode of VF Talks from that Friday, I looked like uh, hell warmed over. Uh, that next morning, I was in my bathroom at five in the morning and I fainted. And it was a time where I think I might have mentioned this on VF Talks the next week. It was a time where I thought I clearly was I was going to be a goner that morning. The reason why I'm saying this is that, and this is my take, and of course you can have your own opinion on this. We have a responsibility to get the vaccine. We have a responsibility to make sure that we're doing the best thing we can, not only for ourselves, but for each other. Now, Lord only knows where I ended up getting COVID, whether it's, whether it's Omicron or what have you. But I got it. And the reality is there are a lot of people in the world that are getting it. But we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility of staying up to date and understanding exactly what we need to do. But we have the utmost responsibility of taking care of ourselves, which I think over many, over the last few years of my life, up to 2019, I wasn't doing a good job of that. Certainly now, I try to do the best darn job I can. In that, getting the vaccine was very important, despite what happened in me at the end of, the, at the end of that week with fainting, passing out, and running a 103-104 fever. The bottom line is, you get a chance to, and you, you're thinking about getting the vaccination or getting a booster, Get it. Vaccines.gov within the United States, definitely a good place to go. But do yourself a service and do that. Yeah, did it scare the crap out of me? You darn straight it did. But um, I'm definitely doing a lot better now. And the other thing is, and you'll have a lot of different degrees of thought when it comes to this, but if we have the ability of staying somewhat active during it, we have a better chance of overcoming it. I will say the one important thing I did during all of that, there was about three or four days where I wasn't moving much. I was barely getting by out, out of my bedroom and whatnot. But I think moving around and at least walking was very much important. Staying somewhat active. And over time, it allowed me to overcome everything. Um, even right now, would I call myself 100% better? No, but I am definitely in the 90s now. And to that point, I was actually at the gym today working out for the first time in th nearly three weeks. So I've made the turn 
the positive turn, a good turn. And now it's just a question of me just staying healthy and keeping that up. A couple of questions popped up as we were talking. Uh, Sarah asks, did you get, did you have COVID when you got the vaccine? I, I am suspecting that I might have because the effect of the Moderna vaccine was larger than what my PCP would ever imagine. I had a long conversation about that with her. Um, so there's a strong possibility that was the case, but nevertheless, I'll never know for sure. And Gilly is joining us from YouTube. He says, it's not as we go forward, it's as we venture forward. Darn straight it is, and I'm glad you're here tonight, Gilly, for sure. So one of the new things that I'm trying to do, and it may not be every single episode, but when I get a chance to, I try to, um, is quoting out of the language of letting go. It's basically... Molly B80's her book, Language of Letting Go Journal. It's a, a passage every day um, from her many books. And I have taken a lot of great sort of information from the entries in there. And from time to time, I will share them with you. And tonight is no exception. We're actually going to talk about that right now. Tonight's entry is about needing people. We can find a balance between needing people too much and not letting others, uh, not letting ourselves need anyone at all. Many of us have unmet dependency needs lingering from the past. While we want others to fulfill our desire to be loved unconditionally, we may have chosen people who cannot or will not be there for us. Some of us are so needy from being not loved that we drive people away by needing them too much. Some of us go to the other extreme. We may have become used to people not being there for us, so we push them away. We fight off our feelings of neediness by becoming overly independent, not allowing ourselves to need anyone. Some of us won't let people be there for us. Either way, we are living out unfinished business. We deserve better. When we change, our circumstances change. If we are too needy, we respond to that by accepting the needy part of us. We let ourselves heal from the pain of past needs going unmet. We stop telling ourselves we're unlovable because we haven't been loved the way we wanted and needed. If we shed off that part of us that needs people, we become willing to open up, be vulnerable, and let ourselves be loved. We let ourselves have needs. Very important. We will get the love we need and desire when we begin to believe we're lovable and when we allow that to happen. Today, I will strive for the balance between being too needy and not allowing myself to need people. I will let myself receive the love that is there for me. When we think about the things we've discussed on this show before, that passage Rain's resonant, and we're actually going to talk about that very thing in February. Um, so when I think about the different topics in February, um, one of which will be codependency, I believe it might be the first topic in February. And we're going to re-explore that because it is a very much overarching concept to a lot of the addictions I've had. Before we start talking about what's going on in February... I wanted to take a few minutes out to talk about credibility and talking about at least the mission I have when it comes to this program. I find it to be an honor and privilege to do this show for you on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch. I take it very seriously. So much so that I actually wanted to take a few minutes out tonight to go over our disclaimer, but then also to go over the journalist creed because there are some parts of the show where we talk about the news of the day, whether it is the thing about COVID or what have you, and there's responsibility there. So I wanted to discuss that tonight. So before we talk about the journalist creed, while we make every effort to broadcast correct information, the venture forward is still evolving. 
We will double check all our facts, but realize that medicine and treatment are constantly changing sciences and arts. Please consult your doctor, your mental health professional, your outreach group, your sponsor or specialist before adopting any change to your dietary, physical, and or mental health regime. This show is copyrighted through 202 Consulting LLC and uh, can be distributed to the public with permission and acknowledgement of 202 Consulting and the Venture Forward. So that's a disclaimer I usually show at the end of every episode, but I actually wanted to talk to that on this episode tonight. Because in all of that, and I'm going to go to Maine for a second, there is a clause or there is a very important document that was written about 100 years ago called the Journalist Creed. The Journalist Creed is very much a high standing document that a lot of press organizations rely on to govern how they do journalism, how they govern opinion and fact and provide the best sort of form for all of that being very open, honest, and being a incredible servant to public, to the public rather. So let's talk about that for a few minutes. I didn't have all the graphics there, so I'm just gonna go over here. I believe in the profession of journalism I believe that the public journal is a public trust, that all connected with it are, to the full measure of their responsibility, trustees for the public, that acceptance of a lesser service than the public service is betrayal of this trust. I believe that clear thinking and clear statement, accuracy and fairness are fundamental to good journalism. I believe that a journalist should write only what he, or hold, what he or she holds in their heart to be true. I believe that suppression of the news for any consideration other than the welfare of society is indefensible. I believe that no one should write as a journalist what he or she would not say as a human being, that bribery by one's own pocketbook is as much to be avoided as bribery by the pocketbook of another. That individual responsibility may not be escaped by pleading another's instructions or another's dividends. I believe that advertising, news, and editorial comments should alike serve the best interests of readers, that a single standard of helpful truth and cleanness should prevail for all. I believe that the supreme test of good journalism is the measure of its public service. I believe that the journalism which succeeds best and best, best deserves success, fears God and honors humanity, is stoutly independent, unmoved by pride or of opinion or greed of power, constructive, tolerant, but never careless, self-controlled, patient, always respectful of its readers, but always unafraid, is quickly indignant at justice, is, is quickly indignant at injustice, rather, is unswayed by the appeal of privilege or the clamor of the mob. It seeks to give every person a chance. And as, as far as law and honest wage and recognition of human brotherhood can make it so, an equal chance is profoundly patriotic while sincerely promoting international goodwill and cementing world comradeship is a journalism of humanity of and for today's world. You'll never hear that on a show. You'll never hear that on any sort of newscast. You'll never hear that out there. But it is on us that provide fact and honest opinion to cite that every now and then. And that's why I did that tonight. So thank you for allowing me to do that. Matt says, most journalism today is trash, just saying. I absolutely concur. And I felt the need to say that creed because I want to hold to a higher standard. Thank you for stating that.
Easy says, took lots of work through the 12 steps to not feel wanted, needed, or love. I got out of myself and approach those who are feeling wanted, needed, and love. Um, he goes on to say, I got out of my own selfishness to help, to help others. It keeps me from being selfish, self-pity, and self-centeredness. Yeah. It's part of it, too. And uh, I'm going to bring up Gilly's graphic because I'm going to actually call him out on this. Gilly says the gonzo journalist creed is to always get the story by any means necessary. I unfortunately agree with you. And I think we lost our true definition of journalism as to what Matt said earlier. It is on us to hold to a higher standard, including yourself, Gilly including everybody on this channel, including everybody that watches this, including everybody who does a live stream of their own. We hold ourselves to that responsibility. I have never felt more passionate about something in my entire life than that. I think there is so much fiction out there that we need to be above that. And if it means us having a sit down to talk about the journalist creed for five minutes, 10 minutes, go over the disclaimer, of the show, then I'm going to do that. I hope you understand that. And I hope you appreciate that for sure. That said, let's talk about what we're covering in February, because in February, we're going to do things that we haven't done before on this show. We're going to talk about a familiar topic at the beginning of the month. But then I'm going to provide answers to a very near and dear story that got me down this road in the first place. So let's talk about that. On February 1st, we're gonna have another look at codependence. And we're gonna talk about it from the sake of the fact that we're always, well, not always, but we're gonna be quoting from language of letting go more times than not now. But we're also gonna take those sort of thoughts and, and really figure out how we basically can rise above codependence and co-addiction. Um, there were very good episodes in the beginning of the show, and I think it's worth going down that road again. February 3rd, you can probably hum a Hathaway song when I say this, but February 3rd, we're going to talk about what love is. And given that Valentine's Day is in February, I think having an episode where we talk about love is very much important. I'm going to take a week off uh, the week of February 8th. We come back February 15th. And we're going, to find, we're going to talk about finding love whilst tackling addiction and that sort of very complicated paradigm that goes on there. The things that we need to take in consideration, but also how we can rise above it. So that will be the February 15th episode. February 17th, February 17th a very important show. I was going to call this something else, but I'm going to wait until I put the the barker for that episode to, for you to see exactly what the name of that episode is going to be. But for the sake of right now, it's called How a Certain Person Saved My Life. What you'll find out by the end of that episode is it's a person who knows a lot about the human dynamic, but also the dynamic of human humanity in general from places you would never expected it to come from. That will be a great episode and I cannot wait to have that episode on this show. And then February 22nd, we're going to celebrate the fact that I've been on this diet for three years. Three years of tracking food, three years where I've lost 300 plus pounds. We're going to talk about all of that. We're going to talk about the story again, but we're also going to talk about the considerations that I have now and that the game is now maintenance and trying to get myself to the utmost best physical shape I can. The diet and the food tracking paved the way for me to start going down that road. <clears throat> As I cough for the 19th time. Um, Easy says, I've seen lots of changes since the 80s when they pulled God out of schools, government buildings. It's gone for shit since then. Just saying. Yeah. Matt says... Regarding the eating topic earlier, I'm trying to arrange a time for a group of us to eat chili dogs in York, PA. Invite open to all here. No date and time yet. I'll keep you posted. Those dogs are the best. I will keep an eye for that. And I'm going to take you up on that, Matt. 
you know darn well I'm going to. You talk about that sauce all the time. You talk about how good that dog, how how good those dogs are. You got you got someone who'll be there with bells on, without question. And Jamie says February is going to be a good month for the venture forward. It definitely will be. I cannot wait to cover these topics. But moreover, I cannot wait for all of you to join me down this road in February. Because I, I've said it once and I'll say it many times. I absolutely appreciate and love this community with all my heart. And I, um, I'm very thankful and blessed for all of you. I'm thankful and blessed for you liking, commenting, subscribing, buying me a coffee from time to time. I am thankful and blessed for all of you. Someone asked earlier, um, how do you buy me a coffee? There's the link down there. Down there. Buymeacoffee.com slash venture forward. Um, your, your contributions, your love and generosity means all the world to me. Because, you know, I, as I said in on YouTube, it's basically presented based on the love and generosity of viewers like you. And thank all of you. I really do. And Jamie says, with respect to, to the hot dogs, she wants to go to. Well, I mean, let's figure out the time and, and let's make it happen for sure. And Jamie says, grateful for you too. Love you, Jamie. Love all of you. Um, Matt says, it, would be well, it will be worth the trip. Seriously, these dogs are the best. Perhaps the best on the planet. They're awesome. I have a sneaking suspicion that we're going to talk about that tomorrow night. Because tomorrow night is Friday night, another episode of VF Talks at 6.30 Eastern, 3.30 Pacific with Matt Haas, Paul Burke, and all of you, where we talk about anything and everything, including hot dogs, chili dogs. And then Tuesday, we're going to take another look at codependence, which I think is definitely something, given now that I'm quoting out of Language of Letting Go, is going to be very much important. But until next time, I'm going to say the same thing I say at the end of every Venture Forward and Via Talks, especially with all those chili dogs tomorrow night. <laughs> stay safe, stay sane, stay strong, stay sober. You're worth it. Have a wonderful night. I will see you tomorrow night at 6.30 Eastern, 3.30 Pacific for Via Talks. Take care of yourselves. Fly be free.